There's an illustrated Bible in which artist Barry Mo Moser does a wonderful job of contrasting the young David, who we've been following so far, with the middle-aged David. In the drawing that accompanies the story of David and Goliath, Moser's, Moser depicts a young and rugged David, forward-looking, his eyes straight ahead, his chin slightly elevated. It's a picture with a slight hint of youthful arrogance. But in the drawing for this next chapter in David's life, David's eyes are downcast just a bit, and his facial features are softened, and they show a bit of middle-aged pudge. And there's a weariness about the whole picture. Taken together, these two pictures seem to say that if overconfidence may be the <coughs> temptation and error of youth, then ennui and restlessness are the temptation of one's later years. And that can lead to indiscretions designed to, to recapture some of that flair of the glory days that have passed. As we re-enter the story of David today, it is spring, a time when the air smells fresh and the trees are budding and a warm breeze rustles through your hair. It's a time when roads are dry and passable and so kings go out to war. King David has sent his general Joab to lead the Israelite army against the Ammonites. And he has chosen to stay behind. Now, it may have been that since David had already uh, consolidated the north and the south into one kingdom, and he'd already resurrected Jerusalem as the capital of city of that new kingdom, so that it was known as the city of David, and he's already brought the ark into that city, so it's also known as the holy city. It could be that he felt no need to in, engage in these spring skirmishes. Possibly it's a sign of strength and royal privilege that he didn't have to dirty his own hands in the mud and the blood and guts of war. And yet he seems restless and bored. So one night he gets up from his bed to pace the palace roof. And from this lofty viewpoint, he can see into the other courtyards of the houses around him. And he sees the Sheba bathing, wearing nothing but the curves that God gave her. And he follows that temptation right down the slippery slope of sin, ending in rape, a cover up, and murder. We can track David's descent by observing the Bible's writer's use of the <coughs> verb send. On its own, this verb has no connotation of sin, but as it's used here, it highlights David's misuse of power. The chapter begins with the fact that David sent Joab and the army off to war. Next, he sent a member of the household to inquire about Bathsheba learning that she is the daughter and the wife of two of his elite warriors. He knows that there's no one left at home to defend her, so that he sends for her and takes her. David's ruthlessness escalates as he attempts to cover up his crime by sending for Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, hoping that he might enjoy a conjugal visit when he comes home, and then assume that Bathsheba's pregnancy is a result of that visit. But Uriah won't go home because the ark and the Israelites are all sleeping in tents at the battle front, and he figures it would be wrong to party when others are still in danger. Uriah's behavior stands in stark contrast to David's. 
So David sends Uriah back into the battle arena with secret instructions for Joab to send him into the most dangerous skirmishes so that David can be done with him. And after Uriah is killed, David sends for Bathsheba once more in order to marry her. The ultimate and the final use of the verb send, though, is held for God. God was displeased. God sent Nathan to David to uncover the sin. Nathan, the wise pastor that he was, does not confront David head on. Instead, tells him a story about a wealthy, powerful man with many sheep of his own who abducts a poor man's only you. The story raises David's indignation and he calls for justice. And Nathan exclaims, you are that man. Author Eugene Peterson in his book about David called Leap Over the Wall says, he reminds us that the gospel focus is always this. You are the man. You are the woman. The gospel is never about somebody else. It's always about you and me. The gospel is never just a truth in general. It's always a truth specific. It's about real people and real hurt and real problems and real sins. It's easy to hold this story apart from us and get caught up in righteous indignation and respond with finger wagging and accusation and blame. But the story is always for us and about us. You are the man, I am the woman. Gospel stories are meant to bring us to that point where we can say, I have sinned against the Lord. And to quit the finger pointing and realize that we are the ones standing in need of help. Peterson also suggests that our confession of sin isn't a groveling admission, that we are terrible people. It doesn't require us to beat ourselves up. The verdict, I have sinned against the Lord, is full of hope because it is full of God. When I recognize my sin, then I can recognize and respond to God, who is the one that saves me from sin. If I'm ignorant and indifferent to my sin, then I am also ignorant and indifferent to this great and central good news that Jesus saves. Corey Ten Boom was a Dutch Christian who, with the rest of her family, helped many Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust. Now, as a result, her family was thrown into jail, and she and her sister Betsy ended up at Ravensbrück concentration camp. Her sister died there, but Corey survived. And she went on and dedicated the rest of her life to God, preaching in over 60 countries. Corey writes, it would seem, after being a Christian for almost 80 years, that I would no longer do ugly things that need <coughs> forgiving. And yet, I am constantly doing the things to others that cause me to have to go back and ask them for forgiveness. Now, sometimes there are things that I actually do, and sometimes it's just attitudes that break the circle of God's perfect love. 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 to 9 is foundational to her theory. I give you a moment, if you have a Bible near you, to look that up. 1 John, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 1 John, the epistle, farther at the back of the Bible. And uh, last church it was on page 1,100 and something. Um, first John, first chapter, verses 7 to 9. I'll have Amy read that for you. But if we walk in the light, 
as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. If a Christian walks in the light, then Jesus cleanses him or her of her sin. Corey claims that this is like a closed circle of God's love and protection. But if there's unconfessed sin in the life, then the circle has a gap, letting in dark powers of evil. In her book, Tramp for the Lord, she describes how frustration over a speaking event here in Washington, D.C. sparked her anger. And so when a member of the audience came up afterwards to seek further information, she was snappy and rude and, and just turned her back on her and walked out. But once back in her hotel room, the Lord began to speak to her. And she chose to go and seek that woman's forgiveness, even though it would cause her to miss her airplane. Closing the circle gave her freedom to walk in the light again. As Christians, our primary task isn't to avoid sin, which is impossible, but to recognize it. We're often to reluctant to acknowledge our sin because we think somehow by admitting we've done wrong it's going to diminish us. But if we stick with the story, the God story, the David story, the Jesus story, we find mercy and grace and forgiveness. The fact is we are sinners and by admitting our sin and finding God's grace we become more and not less. When David was on the roof that evening of restlessness, decency might have tried to pull his eyes away from Bathsheba. Respect for Bathsheba's father and husband could have halted any further action. Compassion for Bathsheba herself ought to have prevented him from him forcing himself on her. Remorse could have led to attempting to accept his res uh, responsibility rather than figuring out a cover-up. And upright morality would have said that his duty as a king was to protect his subjects and not send them unnecessarily into the front so they would be killed. Respect and compassion or remorse are gut feelings given to us by God to redirect our behavior. Our knowledge of what is right and wrong and those uncomfortable feelings we get when we do wrong are like God's traffic signs trying to redirect us. It was like Nathan was God's GPS saying, as soon as you can, do a U-turn and get back on track. Free will is a gift from God. We're not God's little puppets acting out some drama. A forced love is not love at all. So we are free to love or ignore God. We are free to do good or to do harm. We are free to sin or to listen to God and walk in the light. God is not watching dispassionately from someplace above. God is right with us, right in the middle of the mess that we create urging us back onto a better path. God is right in the middle of the harm that we have caused others. I think that God weeps as he carries murder victims home to heaven. I think that the Holy Spirit suffers right with someone in a rape or a shooting or an incidence of abuse stealing their soul for protection and breathing healing into them even while the harm is still going on. 
When Nathan, sent by God, talked with David, he restored God's, David's God awareness. He aroused David's sense of sin. David's response, I have sinned against the Lord, is recorded in 2 Samuel. But his true emotions are poured out in a prayer to God that has been captured in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse my sin. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Nathan assured David, and Nathan assures us, that the Lord has taken away your sin. Our sins, no matter how evil, cannot be outdone by God's grace. We are washed clean and can start again with a pure heart. This magnificent, abundant grace doesn't mean that we can do anything we want without consequences. David certainly had to live with the consequences. It means that when we miss the mark, we can try again. That God will be with us as we recover from our errors. Today's invitational hymn was written by Charlotte Elliott. <clears throat> Once Charlotte was a bitter, angry woman who spread hurt as she railed against her family that wasn't good enough, and she railed against a God who she believed, if God truly loved her, wouldn't let her have disease and disability. One day, after an outburst at her family's dinner, she found herself alone with her minister, Dr. Milan. Like Nathan, Dr. Milan was able to invite her back into God's love. She heard him, but she wanted to know what would she have to do to receive such a love. And he said, you would have to give yourself to God just as you are. With all your fightings and fears, with all your hates and loves, with all your pride and shame. And she came that day just as she was. Years later, she wrote the hymn that we're about to sing to help raise school funds for children of poor clergymen. And although Charlotte lived to age 82, she never enjoyed good health. She did, however, learn to invite others into that life of grace with God. And after she passed, when her loved ones were cleaning her belongings, they found over a thousand letters that she had kept in which people had expressed gratitude for the way that that hymn had touched their lives. Some people today will read that story of David and Bathsheba and use it to finger wag and judge others. But we can read it and see that it's a story of God's grace. That confessing our sins is an act of hope. And we can share this story and invite others to come just as they are and discover God's forgiveness and love. Amen.